everyone and welcome to Nursing School Explain. In this video, an epidural and subdural hematoma. While they are both similar and caused by head injuries, they might be different and it's very important to know what distinguishes them. But first of all, let's review the anatomy here. So we have the head that's protected by our skull and inside there are several layers that are designed to protect the brain. Now the first layer underneath in blue is the dura mater and then underneath that we have the subarachnoid uh, membrane and then below that we have the pia mater which just lines the, the, the immediate surface of the brain. So now depending on where the bleeding occurs is an epidural above the dura mater or a subdural below the dura mater hematoma, a bleeding. Now I've also drawn out here a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is below that subarachnoid membrane, or an intracranial hemorrhage, which is within the brain. All four of those really cause increase in intracranial pressure, but depending on the layer and what causes it, or what type of bleeding causes it, the patient might have different symptoms. So keep in mind that any kind of trauma to the head can cause bleeding inside the head so that most of them occur due to motor vehicle crashes or falls and specifically older patients are at increased risk because their brain atrophies over time so there's a lot more room for the brain to be jarred around if there's a fall and therefore they're at increased risk because of falls. And so the other drawing that I have here is that we need to keep in mind that in our head, in, in our cranial cavity, there are three compartments, which first we have the brain that consists about 78% of the intracranial contents. We have blood, all the blood vessels that supply the brain. And then we have cerebral spinal fluid, which is about 10%. And our bodies are designed in such a way that the skull protects the head from um, outside injury which is a nice design, but now if one of those compartments, brain, blood, or CSF, takes up too much space, there's nowhere else for the other um, compartments to go because the skull is a closed cavity, which is why in children, when they have increased intracranial pressure and their suture, their fontanelles have not fused yet, then you might see bulging fontanelles. So now the brain has somewhere to move. But in adults, or once the fontanelles have closed, the brain really has nowhere to go if there is a bleed, let's say. So if now there is a big hematoma in there, the brain might shift to one side or the other, which um, then leads to increased intracranial pressure. And I'll have a separate video about intracranial pressure and how to uh, manage that. So now let's focus on subdural an epidural hematoma. So over here, an epidural hematoma occurs, like we said, above the dura mater in the brain. It is a neurologic emergency because it is a blood vessel tear, and it usually is an artery that ruptures. And recall that arteries are under much higher pressure than veins, and so the bleeding occurs much faster than it would. Uh, and so the, the blood, the, the bleeding rapidly expands. And the telltale signs and symptoms is that there is some sort of a traumatic injury on the scene, if somebody observed it, there is a positive loss of consciousness. So the patient loses their consciousness and then they have a brief lucid period where they appear to be completely normal and then all of a sudden their level of consciousness decreases again. That is kind of the telltale sign because of this arterial bleeding. And as with any kind of intracranial pathology, there might be a headache, there might be nausea and vomiting as the meninges get irritated. Treatment for an epidural hematoma, it's an arterial bleed, so we need to stop the bleeding. So it involves rapid surgical intervention to evacuate the hematoma and prevent herniation. And herniation basically happens, so when now we have a bleed, like over here we have this epidural hematoma on the left side, if we had that here, that would mean that the brain moves over or gets pushed over towards the other side because that blood, the bleeding now is taking up too much space. And when there's the bleeding extends, 
then the brain can only move so far and then eventually it will get pushed down on the brain stem and then there will be basically dire consequences as the main the basic functions that the brain stem controls start to cease not working anymore and i'll go over that in the intracranial pressure video so rapid surgical intervention is needed to evacuate that hematoma that usually involves a craniotomy so basically drilling a hole inside the skull um, and draining that blood out and then manage the intracranial pressure and like i said you can watch that in a different video now in contrast the subdural hematoma is an injury to the brain tissue and the blood vessels and those are usually venous in, in origin that means that they, the bleeding usually occurs a little bit slower that doesn't mean that subdural hematomas are not as dangerous as epidural hematomas but because the bleeding occurs a little bit slower we have a little bit more time to treat the patient and detect this when an epidural hematoma just as an arterial bleed that rapidly expands really we only have a maybe an hour or two to get this patient to the OR to get this epidural hematoma evacuated. Otherwise, they're basically going to be brain dead. And for subdural hematoma, we have to distinguish between acute, subacute, and chronic. And that basically just means the, when the, the hematoma occurs and the symptoms that you'll see. So acute is between 24 to 48 hours after injury. Subacute is in between 2 to 14 days and chronic can be weeks or months after what might only seem to be a minor head injury. So this might be an older person getting inside the car, bumping their head on the car door. They are fine initially, but then maybe weeks down the road, they start to develop decreased level of consciousness or some very strange symptoms. While well, it turns out that they had a very small blood vessel that ruptured that just slowly leaked inside their brain or inside that subdural space, and now they're exhibiting signs and symptoms. And like I stated before, older adults and also patients with alcoholism are at increased risk for subdural hematomas, specifically the chronic ones, because their brain tends to be atrophied. So again, when the brain gets jarred inside the skull, there's a lot more room for it to move around and a lot more chance for these blood vessels to rupture. Signs and symptoms for subdural hematoma include signs and symptoms of intracranial pressure, decreased level of consciousness, and again, headache, nausea, and or vomiting. Now treatment, because it depends on how significant and how big the bleeding is, might range from watchful waiting to evacuation of the hematoma like we saw in the epidural hematoma. And a lot of times these are patients that get admitted to the hospital with a small subdural hematoma. They might not have any neurological signs. And so they get admitted and they get repeated CAT scans, maybe initially every four hours and maybe after the fact every day to see, is it expanding? Is it shrinking? Is it staying the same? Can we just watch this and observe the patient very closely? Or do we have to eventually treat it and evacuate it? And again, here we want to manage the increased ICP. Now for nursing care in general, for patients with any of these epidural or subdural hematomas, we want to maintain cerebral oxygenation and perfusion. And that really depends on the cerebral perfusion pressure. And please watch my separate video that goes into the details of how to obtain that. And then we want to do frequent neuro checks and Glasgow coma scale as well as the entire cranial nerve and peripheral neurovascular assessments to see is the patient getting better or worse or staying the same. And then frequent monitoring of vital signs. And the temperature is especially important to monitor if there is an injury to the hypothalamus because again, that is the center of the brain that regulates the temperature. And if there's an injury, it might not be working appropriately and the patient might have very um, spiking or low body temperatures that you can, that you could maybe mistaken for other things like infection. So we need to very closely monitor the vital signs. And then we need to check for CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, oloria and rhinorrhea. And rhea always means just fluid coming and odo either from the ears or rhino from the nose. 
And so that means that CSF could be leaking out of the patient's nose or ears. And that would be if there's an interruption to the skull or to the, to the meninges that, that um, protect the brain because the CSF usually shouldn't be coming out of the nose and ears. And the way we do that is the patient all of a sudden you know, has nasal drainage or ear drainage, then you could collect that with a piece of gauze and then there will be the, the what's called the halo sign. So if you put, and a lot of times it won't be just clear fluid, it will be mixed with blood. So you put that on a piece of gauze and then in the middle you can see that there is blood and then around it the CSF will separate and will make a halo around that piece, um, around that drop of blood or that area of blood that's in the middle. And that's a very, um, of course, informal test. So if we're really concerned about that, we need to collect some of that fluid and send it off to the lab for analysis to see if it truly is cerebral spinal fluid. And then of course, if there's maybe an infection associated with it, because now if we have this interruption of the meninges and all these layers that protect the brain that are intended to protect the brain, and now cerebral spinal fluid is leaking out, foreign bodies, bacteria, viruses can get in there and then causing um, meningitis. So that would be a, a, a major concern here. So if we witness the CSF otorrhea or rhinorrhea, we definitely cannot pack the nose or ears. We don't want to pack anything in there and then basically just pushing that CSF back because that might um, increase our intracranial pressure. We definitely don't want to place an NG tube in there if there is drainage from the nose. We want to be very, very careful with suction or we don't want to perform any kind of nasal suctioning. And again, because there's this risk for meningitis. So hopefully this video has helped you determine between epidural, arterial, and subdural, more venous type bleeding inside the brain that's caused by any kind of head injuries. Please also watch the video on increased intracranial pressure as well as intracranial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure and how those two relate to one another to maintain the patient's neurologic status. Please give me a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel, follow me on Instagram to stay up to date on the latest releases. Thanks for watching.